All right, Stonebridge, big welcome for Monty Anthony. Thank you. I don't know how many years ago it was when uh, you first started coming to Stonebridge, but uh, Monty came to our Discovering Stonebridge class, and, and we would go around and introduce ourselves, and, and he says, well, my name is Monty Anthony. I just like stared at him like, uh, the Monty Anthony? And sure enough, yep. And so uh, I was 14 years old when you were a freshman at the University of Nebraska, like 10 years ago. And, yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so here you are. Uh, you know, you're in high school at Bellevue uh, High School, just one at the time, I think. And so you were a chieftain. Chieftain, yes. Yes. You know that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's this thing called the internet. Oh, now yeah. that they learn things. So. We didn't have it back then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we punched out little cards. And, oh, yes, yes. I remember that. That was the computer science class. <laughs> anyway, Monty was a, a football player for Bellevue, and uh, you were being recruited by uh, Nebraska and several other schools. What was that like? Yes, uh, actually, some of the other schools, uh, Iowa State, uh, Colorado, Northwestern. Uh, basically, uh, during um, high school, uh, my junior year, uh, they coaches start showing up at your sporting events, and they ask you questions, they do their research, uh, they ask how tall you are, how fast you run the 40, and they begin following you as an athlete. And uh, from that uh, comes, uh, of course, the letters, uh, phone calls, uh, no cell phones back then, <laughs> no internet, so they're actual letters that come to your house, and uh, calls made by coaches and representatives uh, talking to your, your parents and, and some to you. Um, also, uh, from week to week, you are invited to a campus uh, where you are uh, usually paired up with a current athlete of that institution uh, in uh, the most the last few cases uh, were Iowa State and Colorado. Hmm. So that goes on until you actually sign a letter of intent. What was that like? The letter of intent? No, just, uh, <laughs> the, well, going and visiting other campuses as oh, a 16-year-old. Oh, yes, year yes, old. yes, yes. Um, well, uh, they, in pairing you up, sometimes you end up uh, staying at the dorm uh, with that particular athlete, which is not always a good idea for... <laughs> 16-year-olds in <laughs> high school, uh, especially in those times. So that was, um, uh, and, and really, they, they really like to talk to the parents, uh, and, and usually your mother, which we'll hmm. get into some of yeah. that. Um, but y yes, they pair you up, and uh, they want to make sure that you're a fit socially. Um, uh, my experience, though, as a shy High school kid, 16. My my birthday's in November, so I was very very young. Um, I tended to just think about the next thing I had to do that week in high school. So they want they're trying to recruit me. I'm thinking about my homework that's due in class that next week. So, why did you choose Nebraska? Uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, of course, the primary reason was was Tom Osborne. Um, he, uh, my mother, who really scrutinized uh, coaches, that, especially if they showed up at our household, um, and, and she really drilled them. Um, but he was, was truly the, the one coach that seemed uh, honest. Uh, and you could just, uh, there was a general feeling when he came into the house and sat down. We could see it in his eyes. I saw it in his eyes and his voice. He was uh, probably the one that, that told the truth. A lot of the other coaches um, were recruiting and um, almost guaranteeing that you'll play um, or you'll have a certain position and you'll get a lot of exposure. He was the one that said, you're going to come here and you're going to work. And uh, at the time, I uh, thought of myself as a defensive player, a linebacker in high school, only played offense um, as a senior. And, uh, but was recruited as, a, as an offensive back. Um, of course, I, I asked him, I, I said, well, uh, coach, if, if, if I don't make, make it as, a, as an eye back, this eye back thing, um, can I play linebacker? 
And he said, stop thinking that way. <laughs> you're coming to Nebraska, <laughs> you're going to play IBAC. <laughs> and uh, that was the concept back then of recruiting athletes and then training them to, to play in a position. So um, uh, that, that was his thought process. Um, my parents um, mainly trusted him. Uh, now, the other, the other half of this is uh, my mother. Uh, she had a friend from Europe. Uh, she was actually Dutch, and uh, she visited uh, our home uh, a lot. And just by chance, she passed by me one day and said, uh, you know, if you left Nebraska, it would just kill your mother. And she just kept on walking. <laughs> so, so that little bug just stayed in the back of my head. Didn't matter who was recruiting, who showed up. Of course, I'm looking at the school and their academics and all of that, but that one little thing in the back of my head about my mother <laughs> and, and this person, that, this other person that watched me grow up, it stuck. So you moms have a lot of power. There you go. Hang on to it. It lasts a lifetime. Was that little Dutch woman related to Tom Osborne at all, or was it just... I a, need to check that yeah. out. <laughs> the <laughs> internet! <laughs> <laughs> so here you are, uh, coming to the University of Nebraska, you're a freshman, 17 years old, and you're the starting IBAC. Was that just crazy? Uh, in insane. Um, actually, uh, as, a, as a shy kid who just basically went to class and practice and student council meetings and all of that. I didn't go to parties or, or any of that. So um, at times, you, if you went to a restaurant to have a meal, people would come out of the kitchen and just sit down at your table and just start talking to you. And which, as a shy person, it's, it's a, a little trauma involved there. Um, and uh, you have people waiting for you after class to talk to you or uh, waiting outside your dorm or your, your dorm room. So there, and you didn't have social media back then, but you had that sort of exposure uh, time and time and time again. Um, so it was, it was very interesting. Yeah. How did you handle uh, that kind of uh, pressure, I guess, in, in this being the limelight in Nebraska? Obviously, we, we love our football and our football players and all that stuff, and, and people want to want to be around you i went home <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> and all joking aside actually after games yes you'd see me as a player there but i'm in the car and i'm headed back to bellevue to sleep in my bed in my home because that was the safe place hmm. so my parents kept everyone away all the phone calls all of that um, I think we, we mentioned earlier about what you do when you have a bad game. I didn't read the paper. I didn't turn on the television because you had no social media, you had no internet. Um, I mean, today it's just instantaneous and constant if you have a cell phone. So um, you, you had to have a place of refuge. And uh, actually the church was, was, mm. was part of that process. Okay. So uh, we watched a clip from the Sugar Bowl and the uh, big bowl game, and we were ranked in the top 10, I think, at that time. So uh, the only thing I didn't like about that clip was hearing Barry Switzer's voice over and over again. Like, why are they getting him to be the commentator for Nebraska game? The, you know, and, and every time I watch this clip, I learn something new huh. off of really? this. And would you believe that I did not actually see this, huh. this, this clip until 40 years after that event? Wow. So they didn't, I mean, you played yeah. the game, that's the last game of the season, and then you're, that, that's it. You don't really, they didn't replay games. So this YouTube thing came up. Someone sent me the link, you know, way back when. I'm, I'm watching that. I go, who is that skinny, <laughs> tall, lanky kid? <laughs> but anyway, um, and in the backdrop, too, we played Oklahoma four years when I was there, and we lost all four games. Yeah. So I didn't oh, appreciate that Oh, we remember that, that. Yeah, we know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you didn't get to play the first half of the Sugar Bowl. Why? Yes. Well, um, a couple nights before the game, um, 
There is a booster, which there are lots of boosters. He was a, happened to be a multimillionaire. And there are a lot of those in Nebraska, by the way. Um, and we were out to dinner uh, with Dave Hum, who was a quarterback in, in, uh, during that time, and his wife. My parents had driven down from Bellevue uh, and some other relatives. And so we're out to dinner at a restaurant. And uh, I noticed that it was getting a little late. Uh, we needed to get back for a curfew, before curfew. And this uh, uh, booster had mentioned that um, they had you know, already talked to the coaches. And then I realized that in, 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 in the back, behind, in, in a, uh, um, uh, an out-of-the-way hallway, I could see a large cake with candles. Just so happens it was my mom's birthday. Uh, I, believe, I believe that next day. And so it was an arranged birthday party for my mother. And then I knew I needed to sit down so I could watch this event. And the cake came out, tears and all of that. And of course, I'm still looking at my, my watch. I, I think we need to go back. So Dave Hum, we gather all our goods and we're headed back to the hotel. And Dave said, well, you know, yeah, it's fine. Everything's fine. It's all arranged. Everything's fine. Well, if everything's fine, why are we going up the service elevator <laughs> to our room? And he said, well, don't pay attention to that. So Dave Hum, Hum gets off of the elevator, of course, a couple floors before my floor. The doors close. I'm going up now. Note that I just turned, seven, or I just turned 18 that previous November, so it's New Year's Eve. So, I mean, I'm still I'm this, this high school kid, basically, still. And you're in this environment, it's on television, ABC, Sugar Bowl. So I'm going up to my floor, the elevator opens up, I hold the elevator open, and I'm listening. And because I, I, I could hear keys jingling, and then I heard a door shut, and then I didn't hear, I listened, I didn't hear anything else. So I looked out, <laughs> okay, <laughs> tiptoed to my room. Put my key in the door, I open the door, it's dark in there. My roommate, who happened to also be the, the sophomore, or Big A sophomore of the year at the time, Big A conference back then, um, he, didn't, he hadn't said a word. As soon as I shut the door, the light came on, coach is sitting on, on the bed. <laughs> um, not Tom Osborne, one of the other coaches, because Tom wouldn't have words like that that came out of his mouth. <laughs> so, so, after all of that, the day before the game, um, usually the team does not work out in pads. You're usually in your sweats, uh, your, your gym shorts, you warm up, and then your, your locker room. Um, well, Dave Hum and I were running laps. <laughs> and every time we passed by Tom Osborne, he had some more words to say. They were, they, they were good words. I mean, they were stern. But anyway, and, and some of those were, Dave Hum, I understand you're, you're a senior and it's your last game, but Monty Anthony, you're just a freshman and you can't do that. And in my head, oh, this is just my first year. Anyway, day of the game, usually they take the starting backfield and they, they have cameos. The national media has cameo shots of you. That's what you see on television. Well, when they had that group, um, uh, pulled them over, well, my position coach came up to me and grabbed my jersey and pulled me out of that group. So you're not going to start in this game. So shock, <laughs> immediate shock. Of course, no one else knows what's going on, not even the players, other players. Uh, all I knew is my parents drove all the way down from <laughs> Bellevue, relatives from all over the, the, the nation. So, and we played in Tulane Stadium then, which um, was a grass, muddy place then. Superdome was just a concept at the time. It was just a shell. And so you could see this clean white uniform. The uniform there, everyone's uh, uniform was muddy except for mine. So I'm sitting there, that half, not playing, and we weren't doing very well. And that particular, what you saw there was the, the only touchdown that we had scored, but... Osborne at the halftime, at after half, said, you are going back in. The funny thing about that, though, was my legs were fresh. So <laughs> it actually felt like everyone was standing still <laughs> as I was running. 
because I hadn't played at all. <laughs> Brilliant coaching, then. Brilliant coaching. Yeah. So that was... So basically, you got benched for going to your mom's birthday party. That's exactly right, but <laughs> rules are rules, yeah. and that's the way. But, you know, that's why we had a lot of success back then, too. It didn't matter yeah. who you were. Rules were rules. Although, now that I think about it, Dave Hum got to play. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so that's all. Those quarterbacks. Wait a minute. But he's an All-American, so, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing some lessons from the Sea of Red as well. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. I have a Monty Anthony autograph football. Anybody want this? Okay, so I, I threw it out at second hour, and, and I hit a lady. Seriously, I, I threw it, she went, uh. And so she must have been from Iowa. I mean, like, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I haven't been over this section. Okay, and this is a long one. Nice! I uh, hope you enjoyed hearing from Monty and, and appreciate him a lot. And in fact, Monty's kind of a hero of mine just because of what he does here at Stonebridge. We, I, I asked him if he would start coming to the 8 o'clock service to make room. They always went at 9.30 and it's like, hey, can you make room? And so they've been coming faithfully to the 8 o'clock service now and appreciate that. Uh, but a good, good friend of the church. Next weekend, we're going to hear from another Husker, a basketball player, and Mr. Basketball in the state of Nebraska. It should be a lot of fun. Hope you'll invite your friends, Husker uh, fans as well. We'll learn some more lessons. This met, uh, and then on July 1st, so we got four weekends on July 1st, uh, we're going to do a sea of red in the auditorium. We want everybody to wear uh, red, all right, that day. So uh, all of us will be wearing red and should do that and be kind of fun. And uh, we hope that you'll have fun with this series and invite people to you, uh, with you. Uh, basically, the Sea of Red is uh, uh, the words of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, they are printed in red color. And so when you open up the Bible and you see red there, it is the words of Jesus. In John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17, there's uh, it's, it's a whole bunch of red there. It's all the words of Jesus, super powerful stuff. And it's right before Jesus is going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he will be betrayed by Judas. They've just celebrated Passover, big feast, all kinds of great stuff there. And uh, thousands of people are pouring into the holy city of Jerusalem. It's a celebratory time. Jesus comes into the city, lots of fanfare, everybody's excited, and now, not so much. In fact, there are people calling for his execution. Tensions are high. The disciples are scared. Judas has left the room now, and he, they are probably on their way to the garden when Jesus says these words. Check this out. Don't let your hearts be troubled. What are you talking about? How can they not be? We're afraid. These words are oftentimes quoted at a funeral, probably next to the 23rd Psalm. This one's read at almost every funeral I go to. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I'm going to come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. I love this about the Bible. Thomas, the doubter that we find out, right? He's the doubter, says these words in a, in a moment of honesty. No, we don't. We don't know where, we don't have a clue where you're going. How would we get there? We have no idea where you're going. How can we know the way? And then Jesus says these wonderful words. Thomas, I am the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Don't let your hearts be troubled. It's quite possible that that's why you're here in the room today is that you needed to hear that as well. It's troubling times. 
we open up the internet, we look at headlines, we see very famous people in, in our world, people that we admire, people that we you know, think have it all, only for them to say, you know what, I, I don't even want to live anymore. We have those thoughts that run, run through our minds like, well, then how in the world are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to get the, they have everything, I have nothing, how am I supposed to navigate? It's quite possible we are uh, struggling as well, knowing what our purpose is in life and how to get through this. And we don't know. We just don't know. We don't know the way. We don't have a clue. So we try different ways of trying to make sense of the world. Some of us have even said something like this when, our, when life is troubling and our friend says, well, how are you doing? This is what we say. I'm trying to stay busy. Working a lot, taking up a few extra shifts. I'm gonna just, I'm just, I don't want to, I don't want to even think about stuff. For some of us, it's just more like, I'm just gonna drink until I can fall asleep. Stuff's haunting me, and I don't know how to deal with life. For some of us, it's just like, uh, uh, it's one relationship after another relationship. I just want to have a good time, and I really truly don't even care who it's with. I want, don't want, I don't, I don't even want to think about life for a while. For some of us, it might be a, 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 a pretty good vacation, deal with, you know, t- for 10 days, I'm, I'm not even thinking about stuff. After we've tried all of that, some of us have even said, well, I think I should try God. And we don't even know how to get to him. It's, we've gone to church and we tried religion and it's frustrating and we like, what am I supposed to do? And I, I thought this was the answer only to find it empty and hollow and full of a bunch of rules and regulations that I can't even measure up to. How am I supposed to, it, it, how am I supposed to do this? Jesus would later on in, in, the four, in the 14th chapter says, I am leaving you with a gift and it's the most wonderful gift and precious gift. I, I'm giving you a gift of peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So all the things that I'm trying to do to get peace is emptiness, ultimately. And then he says this, so don't be troubled or afraid. He had to say it twice within a short period of time. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus says, trust in God, well, trust also in me. How do you, how can we, how do you, how, how do you know if a person is trustworthy? Well, over time, you, you know that they tell you the truth. They're honest with you. After a while, you can begin to go, oh, I can trust that person. Maybe it is looking into their eyes and hearing their voice. But it's over a period of time, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. So can Jesus, this is the question we have to solve and answer. Can Jesus be trusted or not? All right? Can he be trusted? Well, has he ever lied? Nope, he cannot. He won't. He cannot. He always tells us the truth. So if he says to you and to me, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, that's the truth, right? And we might argue with, in fact, most of us won't even like, we don't even like this verse. We think it's insane that he would say such a politically incorrect and charged up thing, right? Who does he think he is? I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father. No one, seriously, Jesus, no one comes to the Father except through you. You you think you're the answer? Isn't there multiple paths and multiple avenues and multiple ways to God? Well, if there was, then Jesus wouldn't have had to say these things. In fact, Jesus wouldn't even have had to get on a cross. If the cross isn't the answer to taking care of my sin problems, then Jesus says, I've been lying the whole time, not getting on a cross for you guys. I've been lying this whole time, making up a bunch of religious things and trying to sound smart, but tapping out now when I see a big nail about to go into my skin. No, thank you. But truth and honesty ended up nailing him to the cross because Jesus kept saying things like this. You know, if you've seen God, you've seen me. And I, mm-mm, God, we're one. Mm-mm, that, those are, we're gonna kill you for saying stuff like that, Jesus. And they did. 
That's crazy. Recently, our staff went to an escape room. I don't know if you've ever done this. Super fun place. It's just crazy. Like, they stick you in this room, and they say, okay, you got 60 minutes to get out, and there's a bunch of clues in the room, and good luck. And so we did, and, and all our staff went down and divided up into different teams, and, and uh, there's clues all over the room, and you're trying to put some things together and make sense of stuff and open up things, and, and uh, we're, our group is running out of time. We can't get it solved. And all of a sudden, there's a little, and, we, and the door opens, like, would you guys like a clue? Everybody else has had one. Yes! Yes, give us a clue. And so they did. And you're like, hey, just like, oh, boom, oh, boom, boom, boom. Everything, all of a sudden, it just fit. And we got out before we died. <laughs> Five minutes and 32 seconds left. And I'm pretty sure we would have died because if that little guy hadn't come in there and said, like, here's a clue, because we didn't have one. We didn't know how to get out. And Jesus is to you and to me. I know there's a... a but you don't have a clue. Let me give you one. Oh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We, we don't know how to get to where you're going. Oh, here's the clue. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. Oh, so don't let your hearts be troubled. So if he's telling the truth, when he says that, then we can count on it. Jesus endured the cross because the cross was the only way. That's why he went to prepare a place for you and me. He's doing that right now. For every single person who calls on his name, you'll be saved. The lesson from the sea of red is that you can trust Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, so very, very much for bringing peace to our life. We, for some of us, live in some pretty troubled moments in existence and we're struggling. We just needed a little bit of calm here right now to be able to relax and to hear those wonderful words from you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right. We'll trust you on that one. In Christ we pray. Amen. May you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for being here. Invite somebody to come with you, and we'll see you next Sunday.